to the Department of Corrections. It happened. It can happen. It did happen. There is no place in the church for a priest who would harm children. We all believe that the defendant was guilty of murder in the second degree. The injury tells a tale, and the tale is indisputable. It was considered the trial of the century, the 1986 prosecution of Robert Chambers, known as the preppy killer, a Catholic prep school kid with movie star good looks, accused of murdering an 18-year-old girl in New York's Central Park. Few have delved into his connections to the church, including his close ties to notorious sex predator, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. In this investigation, we take a closer look and ask, did McCarrick help make a murderer. And to Jennifer, nothing I can do or say will ever bring her back, but I am sorry. On March 25th, 1988, Robert Emmett Chambers, Catholic, pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter in the death of Jennifer Levin. While a tearful and distraught Mrs. Chambers sought the comfort of friends, her husband, Robert Sr., maintained a silent calm. Just moments before, inside the courtroom, the Chambers had heard the sentencing of their son for first-degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to 5 to 15 years. Two years before, in the early morning hours of August 26, 1986, the body of 18-year-old Jennifer Levin was spotted beneath a tree in Central Park, just across from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was strangled and half-naked. When police arrived at the scene, they didn't know her killer was still there, only yards away, observing. As police began interviewing Jennifer's friends, the name Robert Chambers kept coming up. They called on him the next day at his mother's apartment on 11 East 90th Street. He willingly agreed to come in for questioning. At first, he claimed he had no idea what happened. When police noticed scratch marks on his face, he told them it was his cat. But he let slip that he had walked with Jennifer out of Dorian's Red Hand Bar that night on the Upper East Side. That's when police realized they were likely talking to the victim's killer and started rolling the cameras. What was going on? Jennifer was laughing at me and talking to another guy at the same time. Did, did, did this get you annoyed? Or? Yeah, because she, came, she asked me to come over and talk to her and then I'm getting in trouble and she's laughing at me and also the fact that the girl I was supposed to meet, Alex, the girl I like, was yelling at me in front of everybody, so it was embarrassing. Jennifer asked Chambers to go outside. They both left Dorian's and started walking toward Central Park, where Chambers says they sat under a tree. She tied him up, and they engaged in rough sex. She then she sat up, and she like sat on my face, and then she dug her nails into my chest, and I have scratches right here. And then she began to jerk me off again. And then she squeezed my, she squeezed my and this really hurt. And I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I was screaming in pain. He claimed it was just a romp gone wrong, her death an accident. So I reached up like this and grabbed, and I came down like that on my hand. All right, she's, she's flipping backwards. She came over this way and landed right there. Police didn't buy it. But as they pressed him, Chambers said something peculiar. But something triggered you. She took you me out of there. there. She molested me in the park. She hit she, me. How could she molest you? You see, we're talking about what girls. Girls cannot. Girls she, cannot she can't, do it to what a you, guy. What are you telling me? She tried. She's raping you in the park. I'm sure that I've I've heard about other men being raped. Men being held well, up, well, tied up. I'll tell you one thing. I haven't. Well, good. You're lucky. You're very lucky. It's I not mean, a very. Been, it happens. It can happen. It did happen. Those comments, up till now largely ignored, may be a clue that could help unravel the dark history 
that led to that 1986 death in Central Park. Was Chambers hinting at something that may have happened to him years ago at the hands of America's most notorious clerical predator? Chambers was arrested for murder. The incident made national headlines, the public mesmerized by the tall debonair teen on trial for homicide. Only weeks later, he'd be back out on the street. With the help of one man in particular, Theodore McCarrick. Originally from New York, McCarrick was at the time Archbishop of Newark, New Jersey, and wrote a letter to the court on Chambers' behalf. From the New York Daily News, McCarrick said the six foot four preppy had a gentleness and a very special respect for persons, adding, I believe it reflects a true respect for his neighbor and an unwillingness to cause pain. Another cleric, Monsignor Thomas Leonard, who once taught chambers at St. David's School, also lent his support. From a 2018 New York Times article, Chambers' mom asked him to write a letter to the judge in her son's case and to appear at the bail hearing. Leonard complied among 45 total who submitted letters on Chambers' behalf. The Monsignor appeared in court at the bail hearing alongside a dozen or so of Chambers' friends. With such support, Judge Howard Bell noted, I am inclined to set bail. It was set at $150,000, too high for the Chambers to pay. Support poured in, including from Jack Dorian, owner of Dorian's Red Hand Bar, who put up his $650,000 penthouse as collateral. Monsignor Leonard also contributed. An October 23, 1986 UPI report notes Linda Fairstein, the prosecutor, accused the church of raising money for a murderer. It led to angry denials by Chambers' defense attorney, Jack Littman, who said, absolutely no one in the church is soliciting funds on his behalf. Chambers was freed on bail on October 1st. By agreement of the court, Monsignor Leonard was tasked with keeping an eye on Chambers, allowed to stay at the rectory of his parish, Church of the Incarnation, where the court imposed curfew, a curfew Chambers flouted. Here's a photo taken at the time of Chambers casually walking the city streets with his Walkman past dark. Leonard would later serve as Chambers' spiritual advisor, visiting him frequently in prison. Several years after Leonard's death, in 2021, he'd be sued by a man claiming that in 1976, when he was around 11 years old, at Church of the Incarnation, Leonard sexually assaulted him. I asked McCarrick over and over again why he would help Robert get out of jail, and he didn't have an answer other than his faith would have him do this. Linda Fairstein was the prosecutor assigned to the case. In comments to Church Militant, she confirmed she was troubled by McCarrick's support of Chambers, which helped sway public opinion. I was frankly quite shocked to receive a copy of the letter sent to the court by McCarrick in support of Robert Chambers. I just thought it was completely inappropriate in a murder case in which there was no doubt who the killer was. Fairstein confirmed McCarrick showed up frequently at court hearings in his collar. It was as though he, by his presence and by his exalted position, was embracing the killer. After he refused to return her phone calls, she drove to his residence and confronted him privately. He downplayed his ties to Chambers. The character would sort of pull back and say that he had not had a close relationship with Robert. I got the sense that McCarrick was trying to really tie the, his relationship to the good work of Phyllis Chambers for the Cardinal of New York and that Robert was an offshoot of that primary relationship. 
Just two weeks after Chambers made bail, he was back in court and in handcuffs, where new charges were leveled against him for three penthouse burglaries he'd committed the year before. He had stolen more than $70,000 worth of furs, jewelry, and silver from posh apartments to support his cocaine habit, with the help of a street thug and rapist. Chambers was born to Catholic parents. His mother, Phyllis Shanley, was born in County Leitrim, Ireland. Moving to New York in the 1950s, she never lost her Irish brogue. She got a job as a nurse at the Foundling Hospital, run by the Archdiocese of New York. She was also a private nurse to famous families, including the Hursts, the Hammersteins, and even the Kennedys, watching after infant John F. Kennedy Jr. It was during this time Phyllis would get a taste for luxury and high living, determined to make a good life for herself and her future family. Since I was appointed the Archbishop of New York, Phyllis would later serve as nurse for New York's Cardinal Terence Cook. She would come to know his secretary, a young rising star, Father Theodore McCarrick. She would also come to know McCarrick's mother, Margaret McLaughlin, who worked for the Archdiocese at the time. Not much is known about McCarrick's mother, other than what he said of her publicly. From a 2001 New York Times article, his seafaring father died of tuberculosis when he was three years old, forcing his mother, Margaret McLaughlin McCarrick, to find work at a Bronx factory making automobile parts and to live with various relatives in an extended Irish-American clan. A 1940 U.S. Census lists Margaret as 46 years old at the time, widowed and living in New York. 20 years after her death, her son would dedicate an elderly care facility to her, breaking ground on the Margaret McLaughlin McCarrick Care Center in Franklin, New Jersey. Long before this, in the 1960s, Phyllis and Margaret would become fast friends their friendship revolving around their Catholic faith, their shared Irish heritage, and their relationship with McCarrick. In 1965, Phyllis would marry Bob Chambers from an Irish-English family of means. A year later, they'd give birth to Robert Emmett, named after the 19th century Irish patriot and hero. But the marriage was troubled, Bob struggling with drinking. They eventually separated, and Phyllis poured her affections into her son, determined to make him part of New York's elite. She enrolled him at age four in the upscale St. David's School on East 89th Street. He did well, serving as an altar boy, elected to the school's honor guard, excelling at marksmanship and athletics. He won an award for public speaking, reciting the final speech of the Irishman for whom he was named as he stood on the gallows. It was there in 1977 that McCarrick would serve as Chambers' confirmation sponsor when he was in sixth grade. He did so as a favor to Chambers' mother Phyllis, who often turned to McCarrick for help in mentoring and guiding her young son. She would also ask McCarrick to serve as a reference for Robert each time she tried to secure him a position at a good school or a social club. That same year, McCarrick would get a promotion, consecrated auxiliary bishop in New York. At age eight, Chambers joined the Knickerbocker Grays, New York's oldest after-school boys group, which counts among its illustrious alumni, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers. In 1979, his mother became president of the group. There, Robert moves from cadet captain to lieutenant colonel, the group's second highest rank. This gave McCarrick a chance to spend more time with young Robert from a 1979 New York Times article on the Knickerbocker Grays. Bishop Theodore McCarrick, the Roman Catholic Auxiliary Bishop of New York, who was attending as a guest of Mrs. Chambers, discoursed briefly on the Grays' possible role as heroes in a heroless world. It was in that same time period McCarrick would acquire the notorious nickname Uncle Ted, cultivating close ties to Catholic families in the area, spending time with their children, whom he would call nephews, 
even spending overnight trips with them. Parents trusted the bishop with their children, honored he'd choose their sons to spend time with him, never suspecting he might harm them. It was during this time McCarrick's most famous victim, James Grine, was abused as an adolescent. I am James Grine, a child, now man, who was physically abused by Theodore McCarrick for 18 years. James was first assaulted at age 11, and decades later he'd be present as criminal charges were read out against McCarrick in a Dedham, Massachusetts courtroom. It would be the first criminal charges he has ever faced for assaulting an unnamed 16-year-old boy. Returning to the timeline, after being appointed Bishop of Metuchen, New Jersey in 1981, McCarrick would go on to abuse others, including Robert Sialek, a seminarian in his 20s. Sialek went public in 2018, during the notorious Summer of Shame, telling the New York Times what he endured at McCarrick's hands. Bishop McCarrick began inviting him on overnight trips, sometimes alone and sometimes with other young men training to be priests. There, the bishop would often assign Mr. Sialek to share his room, which had only one bed. The two men would sometimes say night prayers together before Bishop McCarrick would make a request, come over here and rub my shoulders a little, that extended into unwanted touching in bed. The Metuchen Diocese paid a settlement to Sialek in 2005 after he filed a civil lawsuit. That payout was known to both Cardinal Donald Wuerl, McCarrick's successor in D.C., and Cardinal Joseph Tobin, McCarrick's successor in Newark, New Jersey, even as both men remained silent about their knowledge of McCarrick's crimes. In 1981, McCarrick would be assigned to serve as chaplain at New York's Foundling Hospital, at the time on 68th Street. The Foundling was established in 1869 by the Sisters of Charity as an orphanage, since branching out to cover social services for families in general. As mentioned, Robert's mother Phyllis worked as a nurse at the Foundling. On late night shifts, she'd stay in a spare apartment above the hospital. Others also had access to the apartment, including McCarrick, who had his own key. But his uses were more sinister. The New York Times mentions the apartment in its July 2018 report on Robert Sialek. Bishop McCarrick sometimes took him to a small apartment on an upper floor of a hospital that he used for overnight stays in the city and directed Mr. Sialek to share his bed. Church Militant has since confirmed with multiple victims, whose names we will not reveal in order to protect their privacy, that McCarrick assaulted them in that very apartment. Could it be that in the same apartment where Phyllis Chambers stayed, an apartment her son would have been familiar with, the same apartment where McCarrick would take victims and molest them, that Robert may have been among them? It's unclear how old Robert was when he may have been first abused. We know McCarrick was already involved in his life in middle school, when he was an altar boy at the upscale St. David's, where McCarrick served as his confirmation sponsor. We know Phyllis often turned to McCarrick to ask favors for her son, writing letters of reference on her son's behalf. In return for such favors, McCarrick would expect favors of his own from Robert. Sometime between then and Robert's 1980 enrollment in Coate Rosemary Hall in Connecticut, he started to show a marked decline, turning from star student to drug-addicted thief. His first stint in rehab took place when he was only 14, remarkably young. After a year at Coate as a problem student, he wasn't invited back. In fall of 1981, he was enrolled in the elite Browning School on East 62nd, but would often skip class, losing interest in studies, dabbling in marijuana and LSD. He'd also become part of the club scene. He was thrown out of Browning for drug use and stealing a wallet from a teacher.
In 10th grade, he attended York Prep on East 85th, likely with the help of McCarrick. There, things went from bad to worse, his drinking and drug use leading to petty theft to pay for his habit. According to a 2008 New York Magazine article, friends remember him being constantly stoned, affecting an I don't give a damn about anything attitude. While Fairstein couldn't confirm theories of Chambers' abuse, she wouldn't be surprised if McCarrick and Chambers used each other for their own ends. McCarrick had his uses of the young man, and Chambers used anybody he could to help him in any way he could. Chambers was addicted to, to drugs at a very early age, and I think he would have been doing favors for anybody who at that young age could put in his hands alcohol and or drugs. Would I be shocked if I found out that Robert Chambers was sexually abused by Teddy McCarrick? Not at all. Could it have happened? Absolutely. Robert at the time fits the profile perfectly. He's very vulnerable. He's uh, the product of a, uh, a broken marriage. To look back, your head spins started to hurt and I told her to stop and she just kind of laughed and sat up on my face and dug her nails into my chest. It was in that moment, Robert claims, he snapped, grabbing her by the neck and throwing her over his shoulder. But at least one expert questions that theory, saying this was a deliberate attack, a sustained and vicious killing, not a momentary reflex. Could it have been the culmination of years of abuse? Robert taking out his violent, pent-up rage on his own helpless victim. That was not an accident. He knew exactly what he was doing. So how can that be an accident? Dr. Werner Spitz, world-renowned forensic pathologist of over six decades, has testified in high-profile cases including John F. Kennedy, O.J. Simpson, and John Bonet Ramsey. According to him, Levin's cause of death was asphyxiation by strangulation. He twisted the, the noose, and the noose meaning the shirt became a noose. He twisted it, but he knew that he's twisting it. There's no way that he could not have known. From the New York Daily News in 1988, there were 25 prosecution witnesses. The strongest was Dr. Werner Spitz, the Detroit medical examiner. And the scrapings on the neck, both made by him twisting the noose and her trying to breathe by moving the noose down, downward. So that goes without saying that that almost is like somebody is making a drawing on her skin of what really went on. And that is not changeable. Well, I just grabbed her and yanked her as hard as I could, and she just flipped over me and landed right next to the tray. And then she didn't move. No, he never threw her on behind him. That is not the case. He, first of all, she faced him. And he twisted it. And that is visible in the wound, because the wound actually is two uh, lines of... Uh, abrasion of scraping of the skin, and then two more further down because she pulled it down. Because she wanted to breathe, and she couldn't breathe. These are not, these are not tough, really. Just take a look at this. Just take a look at her neck. Robert, Robert. Yeah, yeah. You see how, how discolored and, and even bleeding her neck is? Dr. Beasley says Chambers broke his right hand punching something or someone the night she died. It's hit something hard at a very high velocity and a lot of impact. A hard thing could be a, could be a bone, the bone around the orbit or the uh, above the eye could be, but it had to be a very hard object delivered at a very uh, uh, strong manner. Not something accidental. It's not possible. In addition to being strangled, Levin was severely beaten on the face. She had a swollen black eye and a loose tooth. There was blood on her blouse and jacket and foot marks on her back, showing she was likely stomped after death. The uh, 
injury tell, tells a tale, and the tale is indisputable. After the jury took nine days to deliberate, fearing a hung jury, the DA's office and the defense worked out a plea deal. And I wish to apologize to the family and to our friends for all the trouble that they've gone through. I've never wanted any of this to happen to anybody. Chambers pled guilty to manslaughter. He was sentenced to 5 to 15 years. Because of bad behavior, he served the full 15 years. What would cause someone to do drugs and then like the feeling so much that they become addicted? And then fail out of school. Probably a child who was trying to get over some trauma. And then who would still be on this potential murderer's side than someone that also wants to keep secrets? I think it's totally plausible. Mm-hmm. It makes the whole thing even sadder. Just just sort of what, if that is true, the impact of abuse like that and what it, I mean, someone's, someone died, you know, and, and who knows? Alex Cap was Chambers' girlfriend in 1986. She's the one Chambers referred to in his police interrogation tape. In an email to Church Militant, Cap wrote, For what it's worth, I believe in my heart that Robert Chambers was molested. In fact, when I heard about this for the first time, it was as if all the pieces of the puzzle came together. Even before the murder, Robert's behavior in the months and years following his relationship with McCarrick would be a giant red flag for abuse today. It was a tragedy all around. Today, Chambers is serving out his time in Shawangunk Prison in Wallkill, 80 miles north of New York City, on unrelated drug charges. He gets out next year at age 57. Church Milton contacted him numerous times for an interview, but received no response. Questions remain. Was Chambers among McCarrick's many casualties? Does the alleged abuse explain why he went from stellar schoolboy to drug-addicted teen-turned-killer? Is it the secret source of a simmering, years-long rage which exploded in a few violent moments one dark morning in Central Park, with tragic results. The sex abuse does not excuse Chambers' crime, and he was rightly punished. Meanwhile, McCarrick, who spent decades destroying young lives, Chambers likely among them, has never faced justice for his own crimes. Christine Niles, Church Militant, Detroit.